So allow me to do a very quick intro on the topic before I introduce our speakers. Um, as we all know, all well, the biggest powers and blocks, EU, United States, China, and Japan have announced their plans for carbon neutrality. Um, the room and need for green and sustainable actions are greatly expanding in every sector, every field, every industry. The carbonization, digitalization, SDGs are key words in the aftermath of the pandemic. Plus, over the past two and a half years, we came to realize how visual options really work and uh, what kind of positive impact this shift can have on the planet. However, we are social animals and we like to get together. And now that the traveling has resumed, uh, we welcome the idea of you know, uh, taking, um, going to in-person conferences again. But at the same time, we cannot ignore any longer the fact that in-person conferences have high environmental costs. So what shall we do? Stop traveling, turn a blind eye, or perhaps find a way to make attending conferences more sustainable. And that's exactly why we, as in Kani, have been working in the past few months on an initiative that promotes low carbon traveling uh, that is called Travel with Kani. And my colleague, Daniel Ponce Taylor, will talk about it later, um, explaining why, which is to focus on the traveling piece versus other factors and what the project entails and how it works. Yep, so good. We have also decided to reach out to um, conference organizers such as EAE and the Forum Education Abroad to talk about what we can do together as an industry. Um, and uh, we'll certainly reach out to more uh, conference organizers in the upcoming months. So conference organizers have a huge responsibility now and at the same time they can have a great impact and really make a difference um, if sustainability becomes priority. So we really, um, want them um, to become our greatest allies. And so I like to see today's webinar as a moment where we kind of all get together to join forces and to learn more about how conference organizers are tackling this huge issue uh, when planning their events and what the next steps are. Yeah. So let me introduce our very well-respected guests. Dr. Elizabeth Froelich serves as the Director for Resources at the Forum Education Abroad and is involved in a wide range of resource development initiatives in support of the organization missions. She directs the forum consulting program, um, works with the annual and regional conference committees to develop conference content and leads the forum sustainability effort. Daniel Ponce Taylor is a sustainability and strategic partnership director for the Intercultural Outreach Initiative, IOI. He also serves as a co-chair of the NASA Sustainability MIG and has been keen supporter and advocate for the implementation of the EU and SDGs as a framework to assess and evaluate the global impact of education abroad and international education, as well as leading the implementation of carbon negative strategy for IOI. Yeah. Daniel is an active member of the European Canny chapter and part of its leadership team. Um, I think somebody has his mic on, which is lovely to hear a nice kid's voice. <laughs> um, and, um, and then we have Dr. Stephen Robinson is an environmental geoscientist with a PhD from McGill University in Montreal and has spent considerable time evaluating uh, the methodology of carbon footprint calculators. He's the director and professor with Champlain College Dublin, is the co-founder and chair of the European Association of Study Abroad, UASA, and co-founder of the Association of Study Abroad Providers in Ireland. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Sabrina Van Spiker works for the European Association for International Education as team lead for events experience. In her current position with the DIA, she deals with a broad range of logistical and program related tasks for the annual conference, as well as organizing other association related events. Sabrina is passionate about integrating sustainability into the association's DNA and worked on establishing a CSR statement as well as a sustainability event strategy. And now, I would like to give the floor to Stephen for a scientific introduction on the topic. But before that, I will ask Monica to please mute the participants um, until the Q&A. Thanks. Thank you, Margarita. Pleasure to be here. And I'll just give everyone a minute there to mute their microphones before I get started.
Okay, sounds much better. Um, pleasure to be here today uh, as, a, as a member of Canady, Canny and uh, as a participant in many forum conferences. Uh, you can see the title of our, of our presentation here is about uh, greening of international education conferences and greening is the title of this webinar. Uh, that could, could, could consist of many things, but my focus is, here is, is on climate change and the avoidance of carbon emissions primarily through conference attendee travel. The key to climate action is the avoidance of emissions, and it's only when we've avoided all possible excess emissions that we can gain some satisfaction with offsetting those emissions we cannot avoid. For me as a geoscientist and international educator with an academic background in carbon cycling, it's all about the travel. Travel by air has the highest climate impact of any popular mode of transportation. You can see that from the top part of the slide here, the schematic shows uh, air travel has a significantly higher per passenger kilometer carbon impact than say travel by train. So travel by air is the highest climate carbon impact. And um, this is data from the BBC, by the way. So while we can make contributions to reducing the impact of international education conferences by promoting things like recycling, meat-free meals and cutting down on printed material, the carbon emissions from air travel to and from conferences are likely to overwhelm all those other savings. The major savings in terms of carbon emissions comes from the promotion of low carbon transportation modes for attendees, most optimally by train. Now, according to Ivanova et al. in 2020, the top five things a person can do to reduce their carbon emissions are listed there on the bottom left-hand corner. You can live car-free. You can switch to a battery electric vehicle. You take one less transatlantic flight round trip switch to renewable energy or shift to public transportation. So you can see the top four of the five, four of the top five personal actions to reduce carbon emissions involve transportation. Now, public perception ranks some other actions higher, however, recycling, less packaging, buying fewer but more durable items, all rank in the top five of public perception, perception of personal actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions when in fact none of those appear in the top 30 of actual actions to reduce carbon emissions. Again, for an event such as a conference, my feeling is that for the vast majority of conferences drawing delegates from a broad area, the majority of climate damage will be done. Sorry, my phone's going off there. The majority of climate damage will be done by delegate transportation. This is where we as delegates and the organizers can come together to reduce emissions before we start thinking about offsetting those unavoidable emissions. Can we get the next slide, please? I'm now going to show some data here from the US and from Europe comparing the carbon emission estimates from air and train travel round trip between selected sample city pairs. You'll notice that Europe, the three on the, on the left, carbon emissions savings are highly significant. Flight carbon emissions are in blue and train carbon emissions are in red. Much of Europe's rail network is electrified and much of that electricity is generated by low carbon or renewable resources. In the United States where train travel is powered by carbon emitting diesel trains, the savings are much less, but they're still significant. So traveling by train has significant carbon savings, especially in the European context. Can you go to the next slide, please? So what can conference attendees do? Well, we can, we can travel by low carbon modes of transportation to attend these conferences, train, carpool, bus, keeping in mind that flying is the most carbon intensive mode of travel. I briefly laid out this case for this, and you'll hear more about this in the, uh, about the Canny initiative, Travel with Canny, shortly. We can offset unavoidable trans travel emissions, but we have to be really careful. Offsetting is, a fin is financially supporting a project somewhere in the world that will hopefully capture a carbon amount from the, from the, uh, from the atmosphere equivalent to the uh, emissions from your actions, such as a travel action. This type of passive carbon offsetting should be reserved only for those carbon emissions we cannot avoid. Active offsetting, in which the emitter is involved in the offsetting action, such as participating in tree, tree planting, is more experiential and educational and suited to on-site study abroad programs with students participating in the offsetting. This carbon offset market, however, is a minefield and is quite controversial. 
great care must be taken to avoid funding projects that would have happened anyways, or funding those that are not carefully monitored. There needs to be certified carbon storage taking place for this to be effective, and many projects do not live up to their promises, and carbon offsets must offer long-term carbon storage. Conference attendees can be selective about the con conferences they attend. Do we really need to attend X conference every year? Is there a suitable conference that's closer? A regional conference, perhaps? Do we really need to send multiple people from our office to participate in such conferences? We can also participate virtually where possible. Personally, I find that my conference participation has increased with the availability of, of, uh, hybrid, of, of virtual and hybrid sessions. I didn't travel to the forum's hybrid conference in Chicago last year, primarily for environmental and financial reasons, but I did present a session virtually. We can also insist that organizers take their environmental impact seriously. Together, attendees and organization members and their boards should hold conference organizers accountable for promoting sustainability practices for their conferences. And lastly, we can combine conference travel with other business travel and or vacation, spreading the emissions over multiple trips or over, over trips of multiple purposes can have the impact of reducing the total number of trips. For example, I just saw an email this morning about a European study abroad program offering a site visit specifically aimed to take place at the end of the forum's Milan conference. That's two birds with one stone. Fantastic planning there. Next slide, please. Well, what can conference organizers do? Well, conference organizers can incentivize and promote low carbon travel to conferences. They can offer discounted registration for those who attend through low carbon travel. They can mention and celebrate at a public session those who travel by low carbon methods. They can help attendees register their low carbon travel and form a travel group for those on the same routing. Slow travel with a group of colleagues is actually a great way to network. Conference organizers can also select centralized locations where access by low carbon travel is optimized for delegates. You can review the home location of traditional delegates to your conference. For example, for a US conference, if most attendees are from North America and Europe, then an East Coast location makes the most sense compared to a West Coast one. For European conferences, selecting a central location, good, good transportation links such as Paris or Munich would make, make much better locations than where most delegates would have to fly, such as Dublin or Helsinki. A great example of this is from a paper that I read from Milan Clower at Oxford, who estimated that the 28,000 delegates to the American Geophysical Union Conference in San Francisco in 2019 traveled a total of 285 million kilometers and emitted the equivalent of 80,000 tons of carbon dioxide in their travels to and from the conference. He estimated that moving the conference to Chicago would have cut travel emissions by 12% and holding the conference every other year and encouraging the 36% of those who would have traveled the furthest to participate, encouraging them to participate virtually instead would reduce the travel footprint by 90%. Conference organizers can also offer virtual conferences and hybrid options. One study of four large conferences in the pharmaceutical sector showed that attendee travel accounted for 91 to 96 percent of the conference carbon footprint. When these conferences were forced to go virtual owing to COVID, the carbon footprint of the conference dropped by 99 percent. We can also promote offsetting for unavoidable measures, and that can be organized by the conference organizers. I've already mentioned offsetting and firmly believe that it is only a suitable option once we've avoided all possible emissions, and we still need to be careful about the offsetting projects that get supported. We can also, or conference organizers can also work with host sites and hotels for low impact events. For example, by promoting vegan and vegetarian meals, by recycling, on-site group public transportation, reducing the heating and cooling demand of the conference venue and hotels associated with the conference, and avoiding plastic and printed material. While all of these initiatives do have a positive environmental and carbon impact, they in all likelihood are fairly minor compared to the travel component for most conferences. 
They are great initiatives and need to be part of every conference sustainability plan, but we also need to tackle and embrace the big question of conference travel. Thanks for listening for a very brief a brief summary of the challenges with conference travel. Thanks for listening to myself. And now I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Elizabeth Froelich from the Forum on Education Abroad. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I'm so happy to be here today and so grateful to Canny for their efforts in this area. We really value our, our collaboration. So the forum, the forum's mission is to cultivate educators who champion high quality education abroad experiences that ignite curiosity, impact lives, and contribute to a better world. So in thinking about why sustainable why sustainability matters to the forum, to me, it's clear that last part of our mission, contributing to a better world, there's the connection for us. Um, we're also um, a nonprofit membership association that is recognized by the Department of Justice and Federal Trade Commission in the US as the standards development organization for the field of education abroad. And our standards of good practice include multiple references to social, economic, and environmental sustainability. And our status as the SDO, that's a responsibility we take really seriously, and we recognize the need to support the membership and the public in their sustainability efforts. All right, you can go to the next slide, please. So I will tell you a little bit about our sustainability initiatives and how we are trying to drive change in the field, um, both in from a thought leadership perspective, as well as operationally um, and practicing what we preach with our own events. So the standards of good practice, they provide multiple references to sustainability, but they're very broad, very general. We recognize the need for more practical guidance about what that really means in operating education abroad programs. And that's why we developed the guidelines for advancing the UN SDGs through education abroad. That was a really wonderful project that Daniel was involved in. We had an international working group um, that had some great conversations, wrestled with some difficult, difficult topics, were really thrilled with end results. And based on those guidelines, we have developed a number of other um, training and professional development opportunities that you see listed there. We have a series of workshops around the SDGs and education abroad. We've had critical dialogue events. Um, we have an award for advancing the SDGs through education abroad. Nominations are now open. The deadline is September 16th. Um, we include an annual conference track focused on sustainability. And the theme of our 2020 annual conference was education abroad at a crossroads, actions for a sustainable future. We can go to the next slide, please. But we're here to talk about conferences. Um, and how the forum is getting our own house in order when it comes to climate action. Right now, we're in the lead up to Forum EA Week in Milan, which is happening October 17th through 21st. In that one week, we are offering the opportunity to attend two conferences, which was an intentional choice. Um, the week starts with our Career Integra Integrated Global Learning Conference, or CIGL, and then ends with our Europe, Middle East, and Africa Conference. Um, and there's a day of workshops, pre slash post conference workshops in the middle on Wednesday. So a little history, our European conference, which is now our EMEA conference, um, was established to be easily accessible to resident directors, on site staff and host institutions on the ground. We, it was an opportunity to bring the forum to them. Uh, <clears throat> and again, like less in travel. Um, and People based in Europe do represent the majority of our audience. Um, and the CIGL, Career Integrated Global Learning Conference, is new this year. But in thinking about the most logical, practical, and efficient way to schedule that, um, the choice was clear to us to do it in Milan the same week as the EMEA conference um, and save attendees a second trip. We can go to the next slide. Um, but I will tell you a little bit more about our conference sustainability issues more generally, the things we're doing. This is all a work in progress. Um, and it's really hard, especially doing this without increasing costs to attendees is really hard. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, I also want to give a shout out to my colleague, Genesis Hardinico, our events manager, who is doing the work of coordinating with hotels and venues and influencing them. Um, to um, move the needle in that way. So we're looking forward to our conference next spring in Seattle. 
Um, our venues are selected years in advance. Um, so we have a number of efforts in place, mostly related to location and venue selection that might not be evident to the general public for a few years down the road. Um, but we do really think hard about those locations and consider um, areas where there is a concentration of higher education institutions, um, ease of access, um, in particular by train, but also by a major airport to minimize connections for those who do need to fly. Um, you might notice, for example, we return to Boston every few years, um, and that's really because of the concentration of attendees that are in that region. Um, it is easily accessible by train, um, has a um, somewhat efficient public transportation system. Um, we'll be back there in 2024. Um, and we're in the process of venue selection for a few more years now, and we are looking at cities that are along train lines and have good public transportation systems. And we are also really excited to collaborate with Kenny on encouraging attendees um, to lessen their impact through travel. And I'm not gonna say more about travel with Kenny now because that we'll hear about that later on, but we're just so excited about that initiative. Um, we do on our conference registration form, provide um, attendees the opportunity to offset their emissions by click checking a single box. We tried to make it as simple as possible. Um, and we are going to be encouraging public and group transportation for attendees working with our hosts. We see every opportunity, every interaction with our hotels and vendors as an opportunity to um, influence them and make requests. Um, when it comes to things like meals or room temperatures, heating and cooling, eliminating disposables um, or ensuring that disposables are fully compostable, um, placing recycling receptacles, things like this, which you know make small impacts. We've also gotten really creative with signage and have eliminated foam core and floor claims and are doing what we can with more sustainable um, solutions that still get people where they need to go. Um, we are working with our sponsors and exhibitors to um, discourage swag and print materials that aren't really necessary. And that's something that we're also really looking hard at ourselves. Um, if you went to our last annual, annual conference, you might've noticed that there was a lot less swag and things placed in your hands than there has been in the past. And we're looking at our sponsorship items and um, operations for future years. And the forum is committed to offering virtual and hybrid options for participation for the future. Um, for Forum EA Week, um, in the lead up to that week, we will be offering a series of three virtual open forum events for attendees who are not um, able to travel or who choose not to. And those will be accessible to all conference attendees. So if you're going to the in-person event, you will have access to the virtual as well. And for our next annual conference in Seattle, um, we will be on site March 22nd to 24th, 2023, but the week before, we will be offering two days of virtual content. Next slide, please. So I am really thrilled to announce that the forum signed the Canny Accord on July 6th. Um, we are not listed on the website yet, but we will be soon. And so I just wanted to highlight um, several of our commitments that are related to conferences. Um, so working with airlines and hotel chains um, to influence them, um, we are, we will begin with our 2023 annual, uh, annual conference, collecting information about emissions from in-person attendees, um, where they're coming from. Um, and so we'll have a better idea of, uh, the footprint of our conference in that way. Um, we will be offering virtual participation options, as I mentioned, and then of course, those, um, catering options. And climate action will be a theme at conferences and events moving forward. Um, we're committed to a track, um, at least for each conference. Uh, I think that that is all that I wanted to say. Um, thanks again for having me here. And I will pass it off to Sabrina. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, 
Yeah, so my name is Sabrina and I'm representing the European Association for International Education. Uh, we are also a member-led uh, non-profit organization committed to internationalizing the higher education sector. We're based in Amsterdam, the Netherlands and are serving Europe and the global community. Next slide, please. Just to give you a brief overview of the size of our conference and our, what we, the offenders that we are. Um, so we're the largest international education conference and exhibition in Europe uh, with over 6,200 participants coming in from over 95 different countries. So you can already see the carbon footprint we're developing uh, just by people attending our conference. Um, our conference has around um, 150 sessions and workshops and a really large exhibition with over 230 exhibition stands. And next slide, please. So the reason why we care is obviously we like to lead by example and our values drive us also to play a part in contributing to a sustainable future for the generations to come. Knowing that as a large conference, we come with a large CO2 footprint, we want to make sure that we know the impact of our choices and decisions and also try to communicate those to our attendees. Maybe next slide. So that's why we um, at one point started the, our little green heart of the association, which really started with a working group that worked on CSR statement and convinced the association that it's time for us to start pledging to some of the UN SDGs. Um, so when we all uh, started, I think what we were missing was really a, a strategy how to really get into a greener event. Um, so our actions at the beginning were a bit scattered all over the place, but it's still some of the relationships we still enjoy up to this day. So we uh, actually partnered with uh, Township, which is producing our conference bags and a really great initiative from South America supporting the townships there. Uh, and we switched to biodegradable coffee cups. Uh, and while we did all these things of, um, you know, uh, renewing our bags, starting also offsetting uh, some of the carbon we are producing, updating our registration systems, uh, making our lanyards out of recycled plastic, um, we, we noticed that what we're really missing is also telling people about it. In our evaluations year after year, we got comments that we're using a lot of plastics, even though if you sometimes turn the cup to the bottom, it says that it's actually biodegradable um, equipment, which means it landed into the wrong trash can. So we really started with um, the storytelling behind what we're doing, making people aware of uh, what what they're using in this moment. If you would mind going to the next slide, please. So um, I feel 2019 um, was really the kick of your fast when we actually started partnering with our venue and really looking at to um, all the actions that we're doing and what impact they have, and also starting to really uh, tune into the actions the location is currently taking in order to highlight them and really make the participants aware um, what we can do to together be more sustainable. So um, together with our venue in Helsinki, we started also working on uh, our ISO certification um, and moving forward now implement the same standards to the venues which are to come in the future. Would you mind going to the next slide? So uh, what we actually managed in 2019 was for once to get a pilot case together, which now helps us negotiate with uh, future venues and also just gives us um, really a bit more of a strategy. Um, we started implementing a vegetarian day into the conference and now actually um, broadened that into that our conference is just serving fully vegetarian meals. Um, we promoted the use of tap water, and that's one of the things we noticed that, you know, some of the locations are stronger uh, on some things than the other, while the tap water in uh, the Nordics, especially also Finland, is really great to drink. This is for um, this year where we're in Barcelona, not really one of the things we can advise as the tap water is uh, not of a really nice uh, quality there. Um, Continuously, we started uh, supporting charities so that whenever we have leftover, um, yeah, leftover articles that we can donate them, 
that comes from really whole stand equipment like chairs, uh, part of the buildings of the, like the back walls of the stands which go to theater companies to really also just pens and notepads that then go to local schools or uh, anybody we can basically also find uh, to come and pick up those items. Then we also thought, um, why not leave the place that we're traveling to a bit cleaner and nicer? So we started organizing uh, what we call a networking event. Basically, um, we're partnering with local associations and starting to um, pick up trash where people can talk to each other to kind of try to bring the two sides together. Um, also, we saw an increase actually from the cities that they help us and uh, to get free public transport tickets for our participants. Um, when this wasn't possible, we actually started to have a small increase in our registration fees, which then actually led to that we can buy these public transport tickets. Um, and obviously we work with our sponsors and attendees also in reducing the printed materials. And I think in that sense, um, the last two years have really uh, put us a, a huge step forward, uh, showing that people are way more familiar with technology apps and uh, all these kind of things and really helping us to reduce the load on paper and printed materials. If you could go to the next slide, please. So yeah, here again, a couple of uh, initiatives that we also have been done. Um, what I said, one of the things was that we haven't been talking about the sustainable actions we took. So we started um, doing those um, as well. So in Helsinki, that was particularly focused on the tap order. We had also uh, cooperated with a Dutch company uh, called Topper, which is producing little cute re reusable uh, bottles instead of having single use plastic um, at hand. And the same goes for when we had materials that could easily be recycled to really provide the recycling bins, but also have a student or some volunteer allocated to help people really recycle in the right way. Um, the same goes for furniture. We have invested actually in buying certain amounts of furniture that now travels with us instead of building and buying the same uh, pieces over and over again and producing that form of waste. And I think one of the uh, biggest things for us was to really start also measuring um, all the waste that we're producing. If it's water waste, um, electricity usage, but also everything that gets thrown out uh, after the exhibition to really know um, how much carbon are we producing? Where are we really big offenders? And then now moving forward, really work in educating um, our participants also what they can do to reduce their impact. And at the same time, also our impact. So if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. So our future plans uh, for this year, our conference is taking place, as I said, in Barcelona from the 13th to 16th of September. Uh, we produced a sustainable exhibitor guide, which was sent to all our exhibitor giving them tips and tricks on how to actually uh, source more locally or get rid of their branded single use uh, printed materials um, and so on and so forth. Um, we're working right now with the venue caterer and developing a sustainable catering guide. Um, this is very important for us moving forward and also to share with the industry, uh, with the events industry, because I think it is a very valuable piece for them to have as well. As I said, um, we are also offering um, just vegetarian meal, as well as actually a virtual component um, to the event, so participants have also an alternative if they um, don't want to travel. Um, yeah, so then uh, one of the also important things is that we're truly trying to get into the DNA of the exhibitors, of our speakers and everybody to, if they need to produce something to work also with local companies to avoid all the shipping uh, we would have to do. And that is, I think, also a big learning curve for us to really source locally for all kinds of things. And um, I think, uh, that is, that is sometimes really a challenge, especially when you look at um, budget constraints or uh, venue constraints. Um, and obviously we're starting to select venues that have um, already sustainable actions going on. I think the last five or six venues we actually went to had solar powered roofs. So then you can already see that also there, the mindset is changing a lot and they are actually starting to expect the customer 
to ask about the sustainable actions they are taking. So I think one of the things to um, take away is also the more we ask, the more we're also getting a product offered, choosing the potentially cheaper options that is just leaving us where we currently are. Um, a little fun thing we're actually doing for uh, Barcelona this year is we're gonna produce something out of all the banner materials that were unavoidable and which would normally land in the trash, which will then for the future we just be the giveaway we have at the stand because that's currently a little plastic tag. Um, and so that's gonna be replaced over the next couple of years. Um, and also we're choosing um, right now to actually use recycled uh, carpet so that we are maybe not having everything in our beautiful EIE colors like we like it, but we're choosing different colors for the sense of that these can be used actually by the conference venues for the next conferences. And we hope obviously that uh, with all of this, we can raise the awareness of our participants to really help us also achieve some of our goals and uh, move forward in a more greener EAE future. I think that's it, thank you. Daniel, I think the floor is yours. Okay, sorry, I was on unmute, I was on mute. <laughs> I was just saying, I was just thanking Sabrina and Elizabeth for their their perspective and all the efforts that they've been uh, uh, implementing over the last few years. And it's, it's great to see all these, um, these initiatives. So my name is Daniel and um, I'm not gonna extend uh, the presentation about Canny. Everyone's signed up to this um, webinar. So I assume everyone knows about Canny, but for those of you who are not familiar with Canny, Canny is the Climate Action Network for International Educators. And it's a volunteer based um, organization that started, uh, it was founded in late uh, 2019 and kind of started operating or started doing events in 2020. Uh, it, there's a global board and then there are uh, regional chapters um, slowly kind of making the way across the world. And um, so um, we we part of uh, the European the European chapter. There's Americas, there's Oceania, and hopefully there's um, others more regional chapters coming up at some point. Um, as as you got here, um, the, the Canada's vision is to uh, is a reimagine international education sector that reaches net zero emissions by 2030, aligned with a lot of the international um, commitments uh, by governments, obviously the the, the SDGs and, and many others. Um, and, you know, we just want to kind of share what, what's happening. Um, you know, we want to lead uh, this, this change in, 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 um, in how we operate, both on the ground, but also us as professionals. Um, so if you move to the next one, uh, please. So I'm not going to echo or I'm not going to uh, uh, say much about um, the importance of traveling or the importance of, uh, of how much of it contributes to climate uh, climate change or, or carbon emissions? I think Stephen's done a, a magnific magnificent job in in, in putting the uh, putting everything in context. But I think you know with that statistic that uh, shows that a lot of the top five were related to to travel. Other than I don't think it was there, but not having kids, which obviously uh, I'm a, I'm a culprit of that one. <laughs> but maybe that's number one. Um, but other than that one, I think when we were looking at you know what can we do as Canny. What can we do to help those um, participating conferences kind of uh, have a, a lower impact? Um, first of all, we kind of asked the question, you know, we are putting a lot of pressure in programs and participants, students, but what about us? You know, why are we not doing anything about it? Um, you know, we should be um, showcasing what can be done. Uh, we should be role models and therefore we should be doing it on a, on a, daily, on a daily basis. Um, there was actually a, um, a couple uh, articles that we just came out of, um, of, a, of, of a survey they did. It was called the Corporate Travel Comeback, the evolution of grand transportation and other trending business travel topics. It wasn't obviously within our industry, but it still it was interesting. It was kind of like 84% of, uh, of the responses uh, were saying that making sustainability was a priority um, uh, in, in, their, in the design of their company's travel program, uh, with 50% saying it was very or extremely important. Um, out of those surveys, 73% uh, were tracking or considering set it, setting up tracking grand transportation sustainability efforts. Um, but having said that, even though it was a priority, uh, they're not willing, they were not willing to incur significant additional costs in order to achieve more sustainable outcomes. Only 6% of those responding say that company currently allows employees to spend more uh, on sustainable travel options and additional 
and an additional one quarter, 26%, uh, considering allowing uh, employees to spend more. So people are saying it's important and it'd be very interesting to hear that was the same within our educational institutions and, and our companies, but then, you know, we're not following through. Um, so it's great to hear that um, the forum uh, is, is actually not only supporting, but it's actually incentivizing with, for example, with further um, discounts on further events, because I think it is, it is a big, a, a big issue, the financial commitment and the time commitment. So what I wanted to do very briefly today is I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the Travel with Canny um, initiative. Um, you know, why are we doing it? Well, what are the objectives? So I think the objectives, um, you know, uh, everyone can, um, can imagine. We started in Europe because Europe has a tradition of, tra of traveling by train, has a great network. Um, it's small compared to other regions around the world. Um, so the, the time um, may not be as, as large spending traveling by train versus, for example, in the US. But the first objective is to raise awareness around the mission associated with our travel business related travel i think sometimes we don't realize we all look forward to, to conferences especially after uh, covid you know i'm the first one that's very looking forward to to seeing a lot of my uh, colleagues met, meet new colleagues i think there's a there's a, an amazing energy in those conferences so you know and you know there's a lot of work get, getting done and i think it, everyone realizes the importance of that but are we aware of that impact and it's the saying that do we need to go to all the conferences that we do or should we prioritize uh, some and then other regionals potentially. Um, the second one, which is as important, is actually to reduce this, those CO2 emissions. Uh, uh, as you saw in, in the initial graph, the, the comparison of um, emissions of flying versus train, especially in Europe, is humongous. So, you know, why are we not doing that? Um, so, and if we're doing it, let's actually monitor it. Let's get some data so we can actually um, showcase what we're doing. Um, third one is actually to create a, a change of behavior. We need to change the pattern of how we operate in. We can't just keep doing business as, as usual as was, you know, we keep saying that, you know, that key phrase, but actually we need to apply it. Um, not only on the ground, on our programs, on our study abroad and faculty led programs, but actually ourselves as well. And then one that is very important is uh, create, which goes, align, goes in line with what CANI stands for, is that create a sense of community among those um, choosing to go in the low carbon options. So the convoys that everyone was being kind of mentioning on the on the chat, which I'm very happy to please. I'm sad, sad to say that I don't think many will join my convoy Mallorca uh, to south of France and then train to Milan or even <laughs> Mallorca to Barcelona. That's an easy one by, by, by boat. Uh, but it's great to actually to use that opportunity to network. It's not a waste of time, more time. Actually, we can work during that time. We can network. Um, you know, we can do a lot of uh, things that are actually, um, if, if, if we have an issue with talking to our um, high ups, um, it's part of the experience as well. And it's part of actually our networking and then we can actually sell it uh, to the ones making the decisions if they're not, uh, if they haven't bought into the, the idea. Okay, next one, please. Um, I mean, I just mentioned some of them, but why, what some of the benefits that we got here? Uh, we know what a pain in, in the butt is to travel these days, especially after COVID with, uh, you know, with airport security and, and just queues and just, you know, showing everything. So, you know, we know that you go by, uh, by train, you go from, you know, center to center of many cities. It takes, you know, it does actually uh, shorten up. You can move uh, uh, around the train a lot more comfortable. Um, you know, there's a lot more freedom. There's, you got, you got cell reception, so you can actually work. Uh, for those thinking, oh, I'm taking like 20 hours versus like six hours. Well, there's actually, it could be work time as well. Um, as I said, no, no airport trans, uh, transfers, which again, can take a lot, a lot of time. Um, you learn about the places. So it can be like an, an, an education experience of where am I going? Um, so it's kind of, it goes along with a slow perception of traveling, slow traveling, uh, but also it's kind of like, it is more enjoyable traveling in, in my opinion. Um, as I said, they stay connected, so you can be, uh, you don't need to go into flying mode. Um, you, and then, you know, you can network. I think that's something that if we start kind of like sharing those, those, um, those different ways that we go and those different routes that we're doing, we can start creating networks. So conferences not only need to happen for the three days, but it could be a couple of days in advance that the conference then starts before we actually get to Milan or we get to Barcelona. It starts before, and that's where our networking uh, opportunities start we can even go down the down the route of actually doing events on the train you know we can actually kind of you know you know if if, if i'm presenting with steven or someone like that i can get there and we can actually prepare our presentations 
uh, for uh, for Milan and for Barcelona. So there's a lot of opportunities there, um, and I think it's uh, it'd be a great for that community uh, building. Um, all right, next one, please. So what have we done? So we decided, as I said, on two conferences here in Barcelona, here in Europe, the Barcelona one and the Milan one, because. Um, you know, we uh, this was like a, a, an, an initiative that started with uh, Canny Europe, but especially because we have that tradition of traveling by train and we are well connected. Um, so these are the two uh, that we started. We actually um, set a uh, an objective of 20 tons reduction of CO2, 20 tons per conference. Now, that's obviously that's a, a figure that we kind of we came up with just out of the blue. I mean, it does make some sense with based on figures of participants that went to but we don't really know i mean that's that's a reality we hope that we get there uh, but to put in perspective what what are 20 tons because 20 tons means nothing to me what what is it so it's equivalent to um two and a half homes energy consumption for one year um 40 nearly fifty thousand kilometers driven by an average car uh what is it nearly 2.5 million smartphones charged and four forty six point point three barrels of oil consumed so that's you know, quite a lot of energy consumed uh, 20 tons. So if we can save some of that, I think that'd be great. So how are we doing so far? So um, I've shared on the chat, uh, the link to the Canny, um, Travel with Canny um, initiative. You can go online, so I'll share, I'll share in a second. But what are we doing? So right now we've got 16 people who have committed to travel slower, to travel more responsible, to travel uh, in a low carbon fashion. And, and, I, and I'd like to point out very quickly that we are focusing on train because it's obviously it's a, it's a good good network, quick, but any form of, lo of low carbon usage is really part of the initiative. That could be car sharing, could be bus, um, could be biking, could be boating, um, it could be, uh, you know, I don't know, skateboarding, whatever, whatever you feel like, something that is kind of like low carbon use, I think. Um, uh, train is kind of like, it's, it's, a, it's a good example. Um, so we've got 16 people so far we've got we we get into 18 percent of the goal meet uh, met if we actually if all those 16 people do end up traveling that way uh for for the milan conference forum conference in milan we've got seven people traveling um slower um uh, low carbon usage uh, which is 11.9 uh, percent of the um, of our overall commitment. Um, I really like the idea that elizabeth mentioned that um that we discussed in the past that you know Let's acknowledge those people that are going to do it. I mean, so when we get to Milan, those who are doing it, acknowledge it. And more than anything, not for a personal acknowledgement, but for others to be aware that this is a possibility and that it's actually, it's not the end of the world. It's actually easy, it's fun. And we're actually having a, a CO2 reduction component. All right, next one, please. So if you want to do, want to participate, very simple. Go to the website that we that is on the, on the chat. Um, there is some very clear instructions on how to calculate um, your initial um, uh, emissions, so initial carbon emissions, with what you in, in, in originally intended to travel uh, by, so plane or whatever. Um, point uh, point here, we chose one of the, you know, there are many calculators, and I, I'm not a calculator, cal calculator expert, but there are tons of calculators. We, we chose one, and the idea here was to do the comparison. It's not about which is the best calculator, it's just really to to, to see the difference between your original plan and your 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 next your your slow travel plan. So first of all, you calculate your original one, then you decide on your new uh, on your new route uh, with a uh, low carbon emission uh, transport, and then you recalculate with that second one. You do a simple subtraction, you know, uh, B minus A. You see how much you save. And with that, you click on it, and then you commit. You make your commitment. So over there, we'll put uh, your starting destination, your end destination, your savings. If you want to, you can put a bit more information of why you're doing it, um, and then you can be it can be focused, it can be featured on the website as one of the uh, people doing it, as because we want to kind of uh, show people that real people are doing this, and we want to show everyone that it is possible, and also kind of share the different routes that people are taking. So if we want to do a little convoy, we want to have a bit of a you know party train going down to Milan, then we can do that as well. All right, next one, please. Um, I think that's it. So very simple. Go to the website. It has the information. Uh, I really encourage you to at least kind of think about the possibilities. Think about if it's if if it's possible. Now we're very aware that you know someone flying from the US, you know, it may be actually. Maybe the only way is actually to, to fly. I mean, I'm not suggesting that someone 
takes a boat from the US to Europe, I mean, that'd be amazing as an experience, but I don't think how, I'm not sure how sustainable, how, not sustainable, but how realistic that is. Um, but consider it. Um, talk to some of your colleagues. Um, if train is not an option, maybe car sharing or bus, um, other, other alternatives. And also kind of like use, we've got a, a a page on uh, we've got a group on on Instagram um, on Instagram sorry on LinkedIn where you can put your your the the routes you're taking and then maybe others can actually join. Um, so as I said, we can start a conference a couple of days beforehand. Um, so these are so the, the social media um, handlings for everyone who wants to connect um, uh, with uh, with Canny at different at different levels. And um, I look forward to seeing you on my boat from Mallorca to uh, the south of France or from uh, from Mallorca to to Barcelona. And I think with that, um, we would like now to open it to any uh, Q and you may have, any comments. Uh, this is um, a uh, an open project, uh, is, uh, so kind of we want to kind of improve it. We want to actually grow on it. So please uh, feel free to share all your comments, or your ideas, or your questions. First of all, thanks everyone for your great presentation. I think it's been at least for me super interesting. And yeah, like if you have any questions now, is the right time. Um, in the meantime, I want to acknowledge the fact that uh, traveling by train, even in Europe, even though like the infrastructure are there, um, it might be you know it might be challenging. So let's not take it for granted because like from overseas there's this assumption that, oh yeah, traveling around Europe is really easy. It's also true that financially speaking, taking a flight is like, it can be way cheaper. And so like, I think like at least Kanye really appreciate the fact that before I'm supporting financially uh, those who decide to, um, you know, commit to more sustainable traveling because this is kind of like a way to support um, individuals and professionals like in a very practical way. Um, and uh, so I just want to mention this. Um, and um, I don't know if anybody else has comments. I have a quick question, but before I just like to leave the stage to somebody else. If there are any questions. Yes. Yeah, I mean, so the comment on the train price here from Marielle, it is, it is a fair comment, but I mean, and, and I don't think we, it is about getting into philosophical <laughs> questions here, but, but the reality is that also we should maybe consider, you know, is, is you know, is a Ryanair flight, you know, I could go uh, Palma to Milan for 39 euros return. Is that a real, is that the real cost of that? I mean, well, okay, well, it is a real cost of it. Of course I'm paying for that, but does it really take into account, you know, the real impact of that, of that flight, of, of that, um, of that trip? No, I'm, I'm totally with you on this one. And that's exactly what I said to my boss when he came up with the price thing. Uh, I said, well, we're doing Erasmus goes green and I'm the one to implement that for our students. So if I can't go by train to Barcelona, I'm not going. Um, and then, uh, well, he sort of agreed and I managed to get seven other people from the university to also travel by train. So that's a very uh, strong statement. Great. Yeah, that's a very strong statement. And I'm aware that not everybody like uh, Marielle is in a position where like she can actually do that but maybe not everybody can like take this take a stand and say I'm not going if you know if I, think I, everyone, take I think I think everyone can take a stand saying I'm not flying anymore everyone can do that irregardless of where you are I'm not I'm not in a very high position I no, but I was no, I, yeah, no, 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 that's fine. But I was about to say like that's that's a great thing maybe don't, not everybody is in the same position to kind of like say it but I want to say that this is the reason why even more we need you know um policy about like traveling policy Definitely. and even more like uh, conference organizers are kind of the examples and like you know like people we look at when we talk about uh you know policy or standards and so it's important that if they take a stand then institu individual institution and you know um see or director or rectors can actually follow that instead of just you know um, it's sometimes it's easier if it's a bit top down versus mm. just like bottom up because it might be like really challenging for somebody. Um, so that's, that's my only comment. But you're like, I know you're doing a great job, Marielle. <laughs> Unfortunately, my my director is still flying, but uh, I tried. <laughs> Um, so any other comments, please feel free to unmute yourself or just, um, you know, type your comments in the chat. Uh, 
I know in the I group there are, to, yeah, go ahead. I have to say, I'm very happy to hear about the, the vegetarian meals because that's also one of the things I'm trying to get our university to do uh, with all the things we organize that we offer vegetarian. Now it's always, uh, you get meat or fish unless you specify you want vegetarian. And I want to have it at least the other way around or preferably just vegetarian because, well, what's gonna happen? No one's gonna die if they just <laughs> eat vegetables. So um, yeah. It's great to see that also in, in um, conferences that shift is taking place. Um, yeah, and how about connection to politics? I mean, yes, <laughs> we say yes to everything. I think if, if you guys, I mean, and, and Kirsten, you're really part of the group. So um, I, think, I think we need more, more hands on deck. And so like, if you, if you feel this topic is important to you and you want to kind of support this green initiatives or sustainable, sustainable initiatives, and you have connections in like with politicians or like the, the, the European Commission or any other decision makers, well, you know, just uh, let us know. We're super happy to like work together on that. Right. Well, actually, yes, thank you. Um, actually, I would like to, um, I don't know, suggest somehow that we, particularly those who are Erasmus coordinators, that we try to um, influence our national agencies um, to also report this back to, to the EU programs, because, I mean, we already get that, that green uh, mobility, um, what's it, a top up. And so why not actually also try to, to influence the other side? So, oh, and by the way, I think that, I mean, flying in Europe is definitely too cheap because at least what we don't pay in Germany is any taxes on, on what's it, the, the flight oil kerosene. So I think that's actually shocking. Whilst the train companies do- I think it's a, it's a European pact after their first or second world war that, that they, don't, they, they don't pay that. And <laughs> I'm all with you, but that's- Arc, a, arc. Whereas- yeah. Train companies have to pay uh, taxes on on everything that they that they um, on, on on their income. So yeah, and the green top up is is well, it's very laughable, right? It's fifty euros a one time top up of fifty euros. I would I would like to see, for example, that students who travel by train get a higher daily rate, or or if they go by plane, a lower one, <laughs> and that would even yeah, be better. Actually, something like that, yeah. Uh, there's a question there um, on the chat. Um, I think quite a few people, because it was uh, it's nearly um, uh, the hour now, but they sign off. But they're, they're talking about uh, whether we're sharing uh, the uh, the different itineraries. Uh, we we have talked about it. There's there's obviously elements of privacy there. But if people are willing to share their itineraries, we are doing that on the LinkedIn group. Um, those of you who are comfortable with that, I've shared mine, and I know many others have shared theirs. And then that's a great place to put it. Um, uh, I don't know if we can do it on the website, uh, but I've, I know I've put my case studies there and I'm happy to put mine, I don't mind, but it, uh, the LinkedIn group is a perfect place to share itineraries um, and then everyone can just jump on, on the wagon. Thanks. Um, so I don't know if there are any other comments. Um, we are um, almost, I mean, it's almost 6 p.m. here. And so, of course, we are happy to stay longer if, you know, this conversation, um, uh, I mean, if we feel that we want to keep the conversation going, but I want to also be mindful of time. So if, um, for those of you who have to leave, feel, feel, feel free um, to disconnect, no offense. <laughs> and uh, I mean, we're officially done. If you want to stay, you know, online with us for like a bit longer, uh, we're happy to, you know, hear from you more. And if you have any suggestions, comments, or thoughts you want to share with us, or, you know, anything you want to um, let us know, which is, we're here, we'll be here for at least another 10 or 15 minutes if you, if you like. So thanks everyone for attending this webinar. I hope it was useful and interesting and we will send the recording together with resources um, that um, we've all mentioned during the chat. So thank you once again and uh, we hope to see you at the upcoming conference by train. Yes, Stephen.